So let me ask you, first person I thought of when I saw that Warren Buffett finally bought some gold stocks was you. Uh, you know, you, you've told me when, when we got to know each other a lot better, I think you told me one of the very first things that you bought with some of your, with some of your first natural resources profits is you went and bought Berkshire Hathaway a really long time ago, you know, and I know you really, you, you really admire his, his approach to value investing. You're the one that told me to buy Benjamin Graham's books. What did you think when you saw that? It's a very important development but not for the reason people think. Hmm. People think that Buffett's purchase of Barrick had to do with the shifting of of his opinion with regards to gold. And I don't think that's what it represents at all. What it represents is something much more profound, which is to say that one of the biggest gold mining companies in the world is cheap, even if you don't believe in the the product that it produces. Hmm. Buffett has described gold as a pet rock. And I don't think that his view of gold as an inert, uh, non-income earning asset has changed. I think what he looked at, or maybe what of one of the underlings in his firm looked at, because remember his bet on Barrick, while it was big for Barrick, was a rounding error for Buffett. Yeah. But what, what happened is their methodology looks at the price you pay for an income stream. The price you pay is enterprise value, which is market capitalization minus debt plus cash. That's the price that you would pay if you bought the whole business at today's share price. Okay. And they look at that enterprise value relative to the ability to generate free cash uh, at whatever discount you tend to want to apply at the interest rate over, say, 10 years or 12 years. What they concluded was that Barrick, as an example, was cheaper than Coca-Cola, uh, a company that they already know that they could buy more of. Mm-hmm. And that's important. What it says is that if you don't have an agnostic view over the commodity price, which he does, uh, that the gold price, that the gold share, at least Barrick, is from his point of view, cheap relative to its ability to generate um, competitive rates of return at today's gold price. And I think that's very, very, very important. Now, Barrick did, I mean, pardon me, Buffett did say some things about the broad economy that are worth our considering, too. He said that it didn't occur to him any time in the last 30 years that you could have a negative real interest rate environment. He said that he didn't foresee a, circumstances, a circumstance where the political and social forces in the economy could so dominate investor psychology and markets itself that you had an artificial cost of capital. Buffett has spent 40 years of his career generating float, which is to say in the insurance business, premiums paid, uh, pardon me, uh, premiums collected before policies paid. Uh, This is money that sits on the balance sheet, but it isn't debt because you don't owe it (laughs) and it isn't equity. And that float in Berkshire Hathaway, $120 billion, is worth a lot uh, in a real interest rate environment. If you're getting a 3% return on capital employed, that's neither debt nor equity, (laughs) uh, your return on equity is much, much, much higher because you're getting a 3% return on capital that isn't equity. What Buffett points out is that in a negative interest rate environment, uh, that float can have a negative net present value, depending on how you allocate it. So he's trapped in this low interest rate environment into having to buy equities because he can't buy debt. He can't put himself in a circumstance where the yield on his float is negative because ultimately he'll have to pay that float out in policy. So what he did say, uh, which gives me great comfort, by the way, because I think he's a brilliant guy, is that the current... Uh, interest rate environment uh, and the current policy environment with regards to debt and deficits is artificial. George Soros famously said that he became a billionaire not by working hard, but rather by finding broadly held premises that were wrong and betting against them. And I think the broadly held premise that we cling to in this environment is that the policymakers are competent and benign Uh, and that negative real interest rates are a force of nature uh, that can go on for some period of time. And I think that one of the 
is that you bet against that falsely held premise is certainly gold. From the point of view of younger investors like yourself, you need to think about gold in a very different sense. The uh, deficits that we're running now and the debt that we're incurring is a transfer of wealth and living standards from people to people of my age, from people your age. We are spending beyond our means uh, to subsidize older people who are no longer as productive a member of society. We're financing that by debasing the currency uh, and by adding recourse and non-recourse liabilities that your generation has to pay for. Thank you, first of all. I'm delighted, <laughs> I'm delighted that you're uh, subsidizing my dotage, although in fairness, I've saved enough that I can afford my own dotage. But I think it's important that young people need to understand that the social construct as it exists today is an income and wealth and living standard transfer from young people to old people. And there are very few ways that young people have to protect themselves in this circumstance. The first is to save. Uh, many young people want to live rich as opposed to be rich. Uh, and you can't be a capitalist if you don't have capital. So you have to save. And some of that capital has to be deployed uh, defensively in an asset which isn't simultaneously somebody else's liability and in an asset that represents a bet against a widely held premise that is wrong, which is a way of saying save and put some of your savings in precious metals and precious metals related assets, particularly for younger people. Interesting. So, you know, they say a lot about Buffett that he buys something and he holds it for a long time. He doesn't buy something and sell it in six months. So what does that make you think as it pertains to him buying, buying Barrick and where gold could go? Has it made you think about that? Remember this. That's not what Buffett says. Uh, what Buffett says is that you make money holding for the long term, but you also reassess your decisions and sell your mistakes ruthlessly. Hmm. Twice in his career, he's been attracted to the potential operating leverage in airline stocks. And twice in his career, he's lost billions but sold quickly. What he says is that you make money by sticking with your successful bets. Uh, Buffett is disinclined towards capital-intensive cyclical businesses. And capital-intensive and cyclical de defines Barrett. And my suspicion is that even 10 years from now, he will not be a Barrick holder he will look for other companies where the enterprise value relative to the free cash generation is cheap. Uh, and, and he will see a circumstance in Barrick, if I'm right, where the Barrick price goes up at the same time that its future becomes less attractive and he will sell it. Uh, I only wish that your listeners uh, and readers and my clients uh, would display the same wisdom. <laughs> 